been hearing signals that the military reform in Russia is might succeed. Uh, military spending is increasing in Russia, and this time around, the military reform might actually succeed, as I said. What are the implications for this for EU-Russian relations, or perhaps American-Russian relations, uh, when we think of that the opposite is happening in Europe, uh, as Pope already has said? Uh, that's one. Number two is, um, well, why is Romania better than Poland and the Czech Republic as regard to the missile shield? I thought that was an abandoned project because it didn't work, but now it's back on the agenda and I hear that Romania will have the missile shield uh, installations, installations. Well, just those two questions. Uh, yes, my question is on uh, the impact of the reset on Europe's eastern neighbors uh, and on kind of political developments there. Uh, at the last Riga conference, Bobo Lowe asked uh, the million dollar question for, for that panel. Uh, under the recent, has Russia's influence in the neighborhood increased or decreased? <laughs> and his answer was that it's increased. This was back in September. I think if you look at the interim, you see what's happened in Belarus. Uh, you will see the new uh, military treaties with Armenia, with Ukraine, uh, so on and so forth. I'm wondering if you could reflect on, is this solely due to domestic developments in Ukraine and Georgia, for example, the war? Is this uh, Russia being opportunistic? Or is this a reflection of uh, lessening American engagement in that part of Europe? In the, in the end of May, uh, the leaders of the Central Europe, uh, the presidents of the Central European countries, will meet the uh, President of the United States um, in Warsaw. What should, what should be the crucial question for our leaders in the discussion with the U.S. President? It's, it's not so easy question. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So, three questions. Uh, one about the Russian military reform and the European military uh, treatment, perhaps, if I understood correctly. The second on uh, the uh, impact of the research on Russia's influence uh, uh, in the East, and the third one about uh, the Eastern European leaders meeting President Obama. What should they tell them, and what should they ask for? <laughs> um, yeah, I'll uh, have to think about the last question. That's the most difficult one. The most, the easiest questions are always the most difficult ones. Uh, but um, um, I, I'm also, uh, I haven't followed sufficiently the developments uh, re, uh, of uh, Russian military uh, reforms. I know there's, a, there's a, been a lot of discussion about this. Uh, I haven't known <coughs> precisely what's happening on the ground. Uh, I would, first of all, make a correction to what uh, Artis Lange says about reforms in some Eastern European countries not having succeeded because I was, I well, <laughs> say that the reforms of the Latvian armed forces uh, were forced to succeed because of the reductions in the budget. But that's just a, a, a passing comment. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think that in many ways the, um, the, the, the comments about uh, the military intervention in Georgia were that uh, they showed how weak the, George, uh, the, the Russian military is. Uh, uh, the comments uh, by the Russian general vis-a-vis uh, -vis purchase of the Mistral uh, is of course of great concern because like he said, uh, you know, what we uh, took us uh, however many, 24, 48 hours to do, we could have carried out in 40 minutes. Um, and uh, in many ways you can, we can relate uh, uh, this issue to uh, the price of crude oil issue, because of course, uh, you know, a lot will depend on the economic aspect whether Russian uh, economically will be able to uh, proceed with the uh, uh, ambitious reforms that uh, that they're that they're proposing. So, uh, those are just my comments uh, on, on on those questions and the uh, um, uh, the impact of the reset on 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 eastern neighbours. Uh, um, I think it's, uh, I, I would, uh, 
really uh, veer towards saying a lot depends on what, ha what is happening in the individual countries, you know, themselves as to how, I mean, I don't think we need to, and I think uh, 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 Bob made this point, that the reset isn't the answer to all of the things that are happening within the uh, relationship with Russia, uh, either individually or, uh, and, I, and I don't think we should uh, um, uh, necessarily attach uh, all of our uh, bilateral issues uh, with Russia uh, or put them within the context of the reset because I think the, the situation is a, is, a, is a lot more complicated than that. I was reminded, however, about one of our eastern neighbors, Belarus, uh, the comment uh, again about the crude oil. Uh, and it was a wonderful, the, the best comment about uh, uh, relations between the EU and Belarus and uh, uh, Russia and Belarus was made by uh, my uh, former colleague, the uh, Defence Minister of Lithuania, when she said that uh, uh, in the winter uh, uh, EU relations with Russia are very good, but in the summer uh, <laughs> EU relations with um, or, or, uh, uh, the, 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 the Russia, uh, basically uh, they look more towards Russia during the winter because of the energy supply, but more towards the European Union during the, uh, uh, during the summer. Um, and um, uh, the other comment that I was make, would like to make on, on what Andris uh, said, quoting uh, Rothfeld, that uh, uh, we need a new transatlantic community, or this is an opportunity for a new transatlantic community. I would totally disagree with that, because what you're saying means the end of NATO, basically. Why do we need something new? When Why fix something that's already, from our perspective, working extremely well? <coughs> namely NATO, so I don't think we need to look for any new transatlantic <coughs> communities. And I'll go on thinking about the answer to the Polish Ambassador's question. Thank you. Well, there's a very, very good set of questions. Let me try to give some quick, um, quick answers. Um, first, on, on Russian military reform, um, that's very interesting. This, in my, uh, If you go back to the early 90s, you'll see every couple of years an announcement of military reform. In my view, this is the first one that's serious. And I say that for two reasons. One has to do with the political reaction. It, 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 uh, it has generated enormous complaints from the Russian military. That tells me it's serious. It's not. <laughs> um, but secondly, and more substantially, is the reason for this, which is, and I think there's, there's on one hand, good news, um, but on the other hand, uncertain news. The good news is, and the reason this is serious, is that, that if implemented, it means the end of a mass mobilization army. That's gone. That'll be gone. Um, uh, that tells me there is at least a tension between the assumptions underlying the military reform on the one hand, and what we see in the military doctrine, which still talks about big wars with NATO. You, I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to claim these are utterly incompatible, but there's at least a tension between the two, and I think it reflects what's essentially an undecided debate about what the core security focus and basis for defense planning ought to be in Russia. I think that's an unsettled issue. Um, now, when I say there's also some issues there, it's hard for me, and, uh, in looking at this, to, to complain about what the Russians are doing, because basically, when I say it's serious, essentially what they're doing is, for the first time, doing what serious Russian and Western analysts told them they ought to do, which is produce a much smaller, much more mobile, much um, uh, uh, military to deal with, with a very different range of threats. And if implemented, that's what this will do. That's what it's designed to do. It may or may not succeed. Um, some of it has. I mean, there have, been, there have already been organizational changes um, which were not easy to do. Uh, the big question has to do with the, uh, one of the issues you raised, Atis, and, and that is about what's the, the, the material support for this. There are a lot of big plans about rearmament, uh, and modernization of equipment, which clearly has been terrible. Um, and I have no doubt that some of this will occur. How much of this, um, I think, is a, and how quickly it will happen, I think, is a much more open question. Uh, in part because there's so much corruption in, in defense spending. So much, um, there may be a lot of money spent where it was going to go. Uh, I think this may be hard to figure out. The second has to do with the, the problem underlying this Mistral sale. We worry about it. I can assure you there have been huge, huge complaints from the defense industry. This is a vote of no confidence in Russian defense industry. Um, if they could produce it, 
they could produce these things themselves. They wouldn't be buying them abroad. This is very new. Um, and that's an, an underlying issue. It's whether, and, and Medvedev, to his credit, has been very explicit about this, about saying, co complaining, defense, our defense industry in Russia is inadequate. Um, and I think the under, this is the, the bigger question, whether or not as part of this modernization program they will reconstruct an industrial sector that can support their defense requirements, for better or worse, is a, is a big uncertainty. Um, uh, secondly, um, now on, you asked why is Romania better than Poland for these installations? Well, in a sense, there's an easy answer to this, which is, go back to, the, to this, um, uh, to the, the Obama plan, the so-called phase adapter approach. What's different, among other things, be, the difference between that and the Bush pro approach is this is focuses on short, medium range systems, and that reflects different, um, both uh, technological opportunities in the West and a different threat assessment about Iran. But that's where the problem is, at least for now. What that means, among other things, is that given, given that change, um, why is Romania better? Because it's closer to Iran. Very simple. Now, that doesn't mean, and this is particularly for the early systems. Remember, this is in phases, and the phases mean that the, the interceptors and the radars are supposed to get more capable in each phase. It is not at all clear to me what happens in phases three, three and four. Um, there's, you know, it is still very much an open question whether there would be some things in Poland or in the Baltic Sea, uh, sea-based systems. I think this is, you know, this, isn't, this is still an open question, and I assure you it's an open question to Russia. They, they would like some guarantees that it's not going to happen. Because it's when you get, you know, if, you, if, if the issue is how you do what you need to do to protect yourself against Iran or North Korea without destabilizing the strategic balance with Russia, meaning without posing a credible threat to Russia's deterrence, it's when you get the, the longer range, faster systems farther north that it starts to become an issue. So that's an issue that I think is still open and needs to be addressed. On the impact on eastern neighbors, like like Iman's. I think on balance I place more emphasis too on domestic developments um, and particularly with respect to um, Ukraine and, and Belarus. Um, now, it, uh, I wouldn't say that's all there is to it. I think there, you know, it's one of the reasons I would like to see actually more U.S. engagement, um, especially in Ukraine, especially in Ukraine. Belarus, I think, so just, I, in principle would be nice, but not with this government. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Um, and, but with Ukraine, even with Yanukovych government, um, I'd like to see more engagement with that government and with civil society. We, we're just part of the group that issued a report on it. So, um, the other thing that I would say, um, as I say, uh, you know, the, this emphasis on that I would make, like Iman's, on what's happened domestically there, I have to acknowledge that I think for some, some people in the NATO establishment, this is not entirely bad news. That is, that the domestic developments um, in those countries um, have meant that, that, that NATO is not going to make very tough decisions about membership, for the, at least in the near term, for Georgia and Ukraine. They're very divisive issues inside NATO. They're not on the table right now. I hope they come back later, but they're not there now. Um, Finally, on the last question from the Polish ambassador, um, I wish I had a good answer. A part, I mean, I'd like to both, both because I'm a coward and because I think it's appropriate, I'd like to say, well, you have to tell us. <laughs> but, um, you know, what do you most want? Um, but um, that's not the whole answer, I understand. I, as I say, I, if, if I were to look at the region in general and say where would I like um, uh, more visible um, U.S. engagement, I would start with Ukraine. I mean, there are a lot of other issues to energy and many others, but where, where there's a kind of, I can imagine, really a central U.S. role, I would start with Ukraine.